and welcome to this video on OCRB salters, alkenes, fuels and polymers. My name is Chris Harris and I'm from alloretutors.com and like I say basically in this video we're going to go through alkenes, uh, fuels and we're going to go through the polymer section as well of the developing fuels topic or DF. Um, the um, slides that I'm using here they are available to purchase um, they're great value. You can get the whole series for AS as well as a discounted price. Um, if you just click on the link in the description box, um, and they'll help you enhance your revision and help you to get that uh, that top grade that you need. Okay, so like I say, this is dedicated to salters, and it matches the specification points taken from the syllabus as well. <clears throat> okay, so. We're going to look at um, the first bit, which is stereoisomers or stereoisomerism, and we're going to look at something called EZ in particular. So stereoisomers have the same structural formula, but a different arrangement of atoms in space. So like I say, an example is an EZ isomerism. Now, we need to know a little bit more about how we get this. So it happens in alkenes, and you can see we've got the CC double bond, and the atoms are bonded directly to this, are actually flat, they're planar, and you might have seen that before as well. So the shape of it is actually trigonal planar, um, and it is an angle of 120 degrees, you can see here, there's the CC double bond, and there's the hydrogens attached to it, and you can see that this is 120 degrees. So the atoms can't rotate around this double bond, because the bond is actually rigid. So this means you get this special type of isomerism, we call it stereoisomerism, or EZ isomerism. So you can see here we've got two different isomers or stereoisomers of each other, okay? So they have the same structural formula, that's the structural formula there, so these two isomers here. But because we can't twist that double bond, um, these are actually unique, these are different to each other. You can see here that we've got two hydrogens here on the same side of the double bond, and you can see we've got two hydrogens on opposite sides. So these are stereoisomers of each other, and it's always around this CC double bond, mainly because it can't rotate. <clears throat> okay, we've got two isomers. They have um, restricted rotation, these two here, around that double bond, like I say. And we get EZ isomerism, where we have two different atoms or groups of atoms on the same carbon. So you can see here, there's the carbon. We do have two different uh, groups on the same carbon. If we had two groups which are the same, we wouldn't have any EZ isomerism. So what does this E and Z mean? Well, E means Entgegen, which is German for opposite. So the hydrogen atoms are, in this case, in this example, the hydrogen atoms are opposite the double bond. Okay, so we're looking at the hydrogen atoms actually for, for E, actually it's in all cases, should I say. Um, obviously in this case it is hydrogen. And Z is Sutsamen, which means together, uh, and the hydrogen atoms are on the same side of the double bonds. So that is these ones here. So that's when we lose the use the letters E and Z. So this one is going to be Zen pentuene. This one here, you can see because they're on the same side, the hydrogens. And when the hydrogens are opposite, we call it E pentuene. Now, you might have heard it called cis and trans. So we call it cis and trans. Cis meaning the same side, trans meaning opposite side. You might have heard things like transatlantic, for example. Um, so that's like opposite the Atlantic. So um, basically, this is when we don't have two hydrogen atoms and we have uh, a perhaps maybe two methyl groups instead. So we can call them cis and trans when we don't have two hydrogen atoms. Okay, electrophilic addition. So alkenes are attacked by electrophiles, okay, due to their double bond. So the double bond has loads of electrons, it's high electron density, and is attacked by these electrophiles. And the electrophile effectively adds to the molecule, and that's why we call it addition. So the electrophile is an electron pair acceptor, so it is electron loving, that's the literal translation of it, uh, and they're deficient in electrons and are attracted to the double bond. So these are molecules which might have this deficiency. So you can see here, here's an example of an electrophile, we've got NO2 plus and H plus, so these are examples of electrophiles. Or you might have just delta positives as well. So delta positive on the hydrogen for HBr and delta positive on the hydrogen in H2SO4. So all electrophilic addition reactions, you have a curly arrow and it starts from this double bond here. Okay, And we're going to use E as a generic example here. Uh, e standing for electrophile. So this electrophile has a positive charge and basically the electrons 
go from the double bond to the electrophile, all of these electrophilic addition reactions always go this same way. So one of the classic examples of uh, an electrophilic addition reaction is the reaction of hydrogen gas with ethene. So the temperatures we need is 150 degrees Celsius. We need a nickel catalyst or platinum catalyst, either one of them will do. This is all done at room temperature uh, and it will make ethane. So you can see we've got ethene, adding the hydrogen to it, and we've got ethane as one of the products. Make sure you know them conditions, they're pretty important. Okay, so the addition of bromine. Now this is a good test for an alkene as well, we're adding uh, bromine to it. So a test for alkenes is the decoloration of bromine water. So we add bromine water to an alkene, and we get this color change. We've gone from brownie orange, which is the color of bromine water, uh, and it goes to colorless, which is the um, the dibromoalkane, which we will form, and you'll see that in a minute. Okay, like I said, the bromine is the brownie orange. The electrophile, uh, and the bromine is the actual electrophile. This is going to add to the alkene. Remember, the electrons come from the double bond to the bromine, and you form a dibromoalkane, which is colorless. So here it is here. This is the mechanism. You can see we've got the alkene here, and there's the bromine molecule. Now, the bromine is normally non-polar, but actually it is polarized when the electrons come near the uh, double bond because what happens is the electrons in this molecule repel the electrons here. So the electrons nudge over to one side of the molecule and we create this temporary dipole here. And that's enough to add onto the double bond. So the electron pair in this double bond here is attracted to this delta positive bromine on here. And what it does, it tries to form a bond with the bromine. So there it is there. And then what happens is because this is trying to form a bond with the bromine, this has to break as well. Because what we want to do is add one bromine on here. Remember, bromine can only bond once. If this is forming a bond with this bromine, this one has to break. So we form this intermediate. Okay, it's a carbocation intermediate. There's the bromine we've added on. But now we have a carbon with a positive charge. We have this Br- minus that's left behind because the electron's been pushed onto here. Now you can see here, the arrows always go from our area of electron density. We've got a lone pair there. That's going to go in and attack that delta positive carbon. There it is. And then we're going to finally get our product, which is our colorless 1,2-dibromoethane. Um, and obviously that's the product that we formed there. Okay, so you need to know this mechanism. This is the addition of bromine. Okay, hydration of alkenes. Okay, so alcohols are produced by the hydration of alkenes. So we can use steam and an acid catalyst to create an alcohol. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and um, obviously we can use the steam and ethene. Uh, we're going to use a phosphoric acid catalyst. Temperature, we're looking at about 300 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 60 atmospheres as well. Make sure you know these conditions as well. So there's our alkene and we're going to react it with water or steam. And we're going to produce our ethanol as you can see here. So it's a pretty much straightforward reaction. Notice it's reversible though. Um, initially we only get a yield of about 5%, um, but thankfully any unreacted um, alkene uh, is actually recycled through and we get an overall yield of about 90 to 95%, which is much more respectable. <clears throat> so, uh, make an alcohol from alkyl hydrogen sulfates. Okay, so this is gonna look at how we can use sulfuric acid. How does the catalyst actually work? So alcohols can be made um, can be made by using alkyl hydrogen sulfates with sulfuric acid being reformed. So let's have a look, see how this might work. So we're going to add cold water, which is H2O, to warm ethyl hydrogen sulfate, and this will form your ethanol. Okay, and this process is called hydrolysis. Okay, when we're adding, um, we're using water to do this. So hydro meaning water, lysis meaning to break. So there's our ethyl hydrogen sulfate, um, and this step is actually made um, by reacting your alkene with sulfuric acid, and we get this intermediate here. Then what we're going to do is we're going to add water to this, and we form our alcohol, as you can see, and our sulfuric acid is reformed. So the OH from the water adds onto here, and the other hydrogen obviously adds to reform the sulfuric acid. So like I say, the first step is the alkene, uh, add that to sulfuric acid and you form your ethyl hydrogen sulfate, which is this molecule here. Then we use that ethyl hydrogen sulfate, react it with water, and we form our um, ethanol 
and sulfuric acid is reformed again. So it's been used up here and reformed here. That's a classic sign of a catalyst. So there it is, okay? And if we're using asymmetric alkenes as well, obviously this is a symmetrical one, but if we're using asymmetrical alkenes, we can also produce two products. Okay, so addition of hydrogen halides. So alkenes react with hydrogen halides to form uh, to form halogen or alkanes. Okay, so for example, HBr follows the same mechanism uh, as the addition of a halogen. So it's there's no difference here in terms of the mechanism. And this mechanism could apply to any other halogen or a hydrogen halide. So obviously we're going to look at one example here, but we can use any hydrogen halide uh, and alkenes as well. <coughs> so here's ethene and here's hydrogen bromide. Now this is polarized. This is a permanent polarity. So there's no inducement about it. So we've got a delta positive permanently on the hydrogen and a delta negative on the bromine. And then obviously we've got that double bond, loads of electrons in that double bond. That's attracted to the delta positive hydrogen, which is then going to break this bond here. So there it is. And then we're going to break that bond. So it's the same as the bromine mechanism as we've just seen. Okay, so we've got this carbocation that's formed. As you can see here, there's the carbocation. We've got the carbon with the positive charge. Uh, and obviously we've got the bromide ion here, which has just received the electrons from this step. Uh, and you can imagine, obviously, lone pair of electrons, the arrow is going to go from here to the delta positive carbon. There it is. Okay, and then that's going to add on. And we're going to form bromoethane as being created. You can see we've got the bromine here, uh, obviously attached to the, um, the, the carbocation intermediate that we've got there. So that's bromoethane. Okay, so reacting hydrogen halides with in unsymmetrical alkenes actually produces two different products, a bit like the sulfuric acid example that we'd seen before. So let's show how that works. So here's propionine. You can see this is an unsymmetrical alkene because the double bond's on one side. And we have the HBr here. As you can see, you've got the hydrogen and the bromine. And just like before, obviously the mechanism is the same, where the electrons are going to come from the double bond to the hydrogen and then that's going to break and the electrons are going to jump onto the bromine. And you can see here that we've got our carbocation intermediate here with our bromide ion with a lone pair of electrons on the bromine. And we can also form a carbocation in the middle here, as you can see. Uh, again, we still have our Br-. minus. Now, the reason why is because actually we can either add the hydrogen onto this carbon here and we can form a secondary carbocation or we can add the hydrogen onto this carbon here and form a primary carbocation. Now you can see here that actually if we add it onto here, we form one bromopropane. Um, obviously we get this product here. And then if we add it into the second carbon, we get two bromopropanes. So you can see here that we get two different products being produced uh, from this mechanism. So as long as you could show that with unsymmetrical alkenes, we get two different products, that's the main thing. Okay, so addition polymers. So a lot of alkenes obviously used to make polymers. So alkenes are monomers and they join to form addition polymers. Okay, so we add them together. So polymers are made from monomer units and they can either be natural, which means we're using things like proteins or natural rubber, um, or synthetic. So for example, uh, polyethene and polypropene. Okay, so these are obviously examples of synthetic polymers. So polymers have been used for a while now, uh, and actually it was Charles Goodyear who, way back in 1844, discovered vulcanized rubber. So this was uh, rubber which was a lot harder wearing than natural rubber and could withstand a greater range of temperatures without, without changing its properties. Um, and actually he discovered it by accident, actually. He was trying to look for new properties of rubber. He was, that's what he was trying to do, but he accidentally came across this new uh, recipe to make this stuff here. Um, and actually, we still see Goodyear tyres around today. So just showing you kind of, um, obviously, how we've altered the properties of a, of a natural material to make it suitable for modern day life. Now, obviously, in the last 100 years, we've come a long way since then. Um, and we've got uh, products such as polyethene, which is nylon and Teflon, etc. So all these different products and these uh, polymers have actually revolutionised the way we live today. Um, obviously, we've got um, plastic bottles now and plastics are all around us in cars and calculators, uh, even down to clothing as well. 
Obviously, new polymers have been made all the time. Um, they've got brand new properties and uses. So smart watches are a good example of that. Um, you can see, obviously, you've got plastics all over that as well, and they can do all sorts. You can weave electronics within to them, and so they're they're pretty handy out, and they are becoming increasingly more sophisticated. Okay, so to make polypropene, okay, um, we need uh, so we need the monomer propene. And we need to add a few of these together to make polypropene. Okay, so we're going to make, uh, we're going to join a few of them together. So this is the monomer propene, uh, and actually, what happens is this double bond will open up and it will form the polymer. So let's have a look. There it is. There you can see the double bond's been removed. We have this single bond here. Now, there's a few features that I want to point out on here. So the end bit remains many repeat units because it's a polymer. So we have a lot of these units repeating over and over again. Uh, this is one repeat unit that's been shown here, um, but notice we don't have that double bond anymore because that's now been opened up. And it's opened up into these, which are trailing bonds. Now these extend beyond the brackets. You've got to have brackets to show the uh, repeating unit, um, but we have these trailing bonds, and basically this is where we get more of these units, these repeat units, joining together into a big long chain. So you can see here, this one is showing two repeat units of two monomers, and you can see these are obviously joined together. So polyalkenes, these are saturated molecules, uh, normally non-polar, and so obviously they're unreactive, um, so they don't react with anything, uh, and they don't degrade well in landfills. So they have got a bit of a problem uh, with these uh, particular types of polymers if they are um, addition ones like polyalkenes. Okay, so let's look at the combustion of alkanes, because obviously we can use them as fuels. Um, alkanes burn in oxygen completely. That means a plentiful supply of oxygen uh, and they form carbon dioxide and water. And they're really good fuels. They burn readily to produce large amounts of energy. We use them all the time. And basically, the longer the alkane, the more energy they produce. So we've got loads of different uses. So they're used to power vehicles. Um, electricity um, can be uh, used for uh, fuels. So things like oil and gas. Um, and that can be made, obviously, by burning them uh, and generating electricity. So the equation for the complete combustion of butane, there's butane there, react it with some oxygen, and again, because it's complete combustion, we form carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so make sure you can write an equation showing combustion and balance it. So you may be asked to show the combustion of cycloalkanes as well, um, and alkenes and alcohols, but they all produce carbon dioxide and water too. So just make sure that you know, obviously, how to balance them as well for these different uh, reactants too. Okay, so carbon dioxide and global warming. So greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, they absorb this infrared radiation. Now, you've got electromagnetic radiation from the sun. This reaches the earth and is absorbed by the land and sea. Okay, so this is obviously how we, we get our warmth. And some of this radiation is actually re-emitted back as infrared radiation back into the atmosphere. Now, we've got these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and we've got things like carbon dioxide, water, and methane. So these are greenhouse gases, which you could find in the atmosphere. Now, these greenhouse gases, they absorb this radiation that's been re-emitted, um, and uh, effectively, th they absorb it, and it traps it within the Earth. And we call this the greenhouse effect. Um, and basically, this is leading to melting ice caps and rising sea levels, and you're seeing sea levels rise globally as well. And basically human activities such as uh, us burning fuels for energy um, and the use of landfill, which can release uh, methane into the atmosphere as things decompose. Um, this is basically leading to the gradual warming of the earth and we're getting this enhanced greenhouse effect um, where we're getting um, obviously extra uh, warming of the earth, natural warming because of these uh, greenhouse gases, especially methane, which is especially potent. Okay, so incomplete combustion of alkanes. So actually, when we burn an alkane with limited oxygen supply, we produce carbon monoxide, which is CO, and carbon, which is soot. And uh, incomplete combustion obviously occurs. Now, this is quite normal. It's very rare to get absolute complete combustion of any fuel. Um, there's going to be a time when we do get some incomplete combustion. Um, so most boilers, gas boilers in houses, uh, will burn um, slightly in with some incomplete combustion. That's why boilers must have good ventilation to make sure you get as much oxygen in there as possible. 
Um, but um, if a boiler is obviously in a bedroom uh, and it does go faulty and it is not burning as efficiently as it should be and it's producing carbon monoxide, then obviously you need the carbon monoxide detectors to try and detect this poisonous gas because you can't smell it or see it. So here's a, an equation showing the incomplete combustion of butane. There's butane there, C4H10, reacting with oxygen. And our product, instead of carbon dioxide, is carbon monoxide and water. So just be prepared again to balance it. Uh, like I say, carbon monoxide is poisonous. What it actually does is it bonds to the hemoglobin in your red blood cells and prevents oxygen from bonding to it. So it's displacing the oxygen. Um, now, obviously, that's going to be quite um, problematic because effectively it is um, it is removing oxygen from the blood uh, or it's displacing it and your cells need that oxygen to respire. And if they don't have that oxygen, they can't respire and then you've got a real problem on your hands. But luckily, this carbon monoxide can be removed because um, some carbon monoxide is produced by cars um, and vans and vehicles and we can remove that using a catalytic converter. So soot is another one of these problems as well, which is produced from incomplete combustion um, and particulates as well. So acid droplets that are produced from burning the fuel. Uh, this can cause breathing problems um, and they also increase the risk of cardiovascular issues as well. So this is things to do with the heart. Um, so obviously these pollutants are not very good if we breathe too much of them in. Now, obviously, just like with the complete combustion, you may be asked to uh, show the combustion of cycloalkanes, alkenes and alcohols but don't worry they actually produce the same products so uh, carbon monoxide and water so actually the reaction is going to be the same just balance it in a slightly different way. Okay so photochemical smog so unburnt hydrocarbons and oxides of nitrogen they contribute to this photochemical smog particularly at lower levels so ozone occurs in the um, lowest level of the atmosphere of the atmosphere okay and we call that the troposphere um, and this exact and this exists as sunlight hydrocarbons and nitrogen dioxide mix um, and that forms ozone okay now ozone is really useful in the upper atmosphere because it absorbs ultraviolet radiation but it's no good at lower levels okay and pollution is actually creating um, higher levels of ozone uh, in the troposphere so a great deal of hydrocarbons and these nitrogen dioxide these come from cars and factories so when solid carbon particulates and ozone mix, we create this photochemical smog. Okay, and this picture here shows um, actually some photochemical smog from what was then the World Trade Towers in New York. And you can see here, obviously, the haziness around here. That is photochemical smog. Now, photochemical smog, obviously, this harms the respiratory system in animals, damages plants as well, which is not very much good. And ozone, when we talked about ozone, we're saying it was useful in the upper atmospheres, uh, but not at the lower one in the troposphere. Uh, it's actually toxic to humans, so we shouldn't be breathing this in. Um, but it is being formed because of these mix, this mix of sunlight, hydrocarbons, and nitrogen dioxide. Okay, acid rain. So when we burn fossil fuels, we release sulfur dioxide um, and oxides of nitrogen as well. And these contribute to acid rain. Now, acid rain, no surprise, you probably might have seen this, uh, damages plants, it kills fish as well, and causes erosion to buildings. So it causes a lot of damage. You can see in the picture here, this is a, a forest that's been uh, damaged through extensive acid rain. Now, some fossil fuels, they contain sulfur-based impurities, and when burnt, the sulfur reacts with the oxygen, and that produces sulfur dioxide. Now, the oxygen is obviously naturally found in the air when we burn the fuel. Now, sulfur dioxide is acidic, um, and it reacts with the water in the atmosphere to form sulfur di sulfur di sulfuric acid and uh, that falls as acid rain um, and nitrogen oxides or oxides of nitrogen do the same as well except they fall as nitric acid which is again still an acid so it's um, acid rain so like I say n oxides of nitrogen uh, as we're talking about here these are produced when nitrogen and oxygen naturally found in the air is heated so in a car engine it gets really hot and the nitrogen and oxygen that's naturally found in the air, there's enough energy there for them to combine and they form these oxides of nitrogen. Sometimes it's written as NOx with a little x there um, and basically these are not very good either. So these dissolve in the water like I say and they form nitric acid um, and obviously that contributes to the acid rain. So we've got two things there that are a bit of a concern. 
So how do we reduce the levels of these gases then? Because obviously they're not very good, they, they create acid rain. So these acidic gases actually they can be neutralized, thankfully. So you can see here, removing sulfur dioxide um, and oxides of nitrogen actually from uh, flue gases, um, and we call it a process called wet scrubbing. Uh, it's basically just a method where we spray an alkali uh, to neutralize the sulfur dioxide or the oxides of nitrogen into the flue gases. And what it does is wet scrubbing is basically just a solution of calcium carbonate or calcium oxide, either one of them, in water. We spray that onto this acidic gas that's coming out and it neutralizes it. Um, and actually we can use some of the, um, the products that form. Um, we can make plasterboard from some of it, so it's pretty handy. And also we're stopping this from going into the atmosphere, as you can see in this picture. Okay, so fossil fuels, um, obviously... Fossil fuels are made from animals that have been uh, living millions of years ago and plants as well for coal. Um, they're a valuable resource. We do need them. We do use them. Um, obviously, despite all the negative um, products, the byproducts that we produce from them. So fossil fuels, these are non-renewable. This means that they will run out eventually and they include coal, oil and gas or natural gas. Now, these can be extracted easily. It doesn't take much effort. They're a good source of energy as a fuel as well. So loads of energy is in there. Now, fossil fuels will run out. Oil in particular is in a really short supply. It's becoming increasingly difficult to extract. This means it's costing a fortune to extract this oil. Um, and um, for any of those people who do economics, you'll know that eventually, once the price reaches a certain level, if there is a suitable alternative to the fossil fuel, then demand will fall for it because eventually it just becomes too expensive to extract um, for its use. Or what we can do is reduce our reliance on these fossil fuels and try and seek for alternatives, which you'll need to know for this unit actually as well. Okay, so catalytic converters, like we mentioned before, um, these are found mainly in vehicles. Uh, you find them on the underside of vehicles and they help to reduce these harmful pollutants entering the atmosphere because we are globally we are becoming increasingly more reliant on cars now catalytic converters they help to reduce the amount of unburnt hydrocarbons and oxides of nitrogen going into the atmosphere so they're pretty useful they normally contain really precious metals like platinum rhodium and iridium metals in the catalytic converter so they're pretty precious uh, and what they do is they convert some of these harmful gases like carbon monoxide oxides of nitrogen and unburnt hydrocarbons into less harmful ones now they're still not brilliant but they're better than what was coming out if we didn't have a catalytic converter we produce things like uh, water vapor nitrogen which is perfectly fine because that's in the atmosphere anyway and carbon dioxide which obviously we know can contribute to um, uh, global warming now you can see here nitrogen monoxide is actually converted to nitrogen and oxygen so you can see here this is one of the oxides of nitrogen and this is just showing how it can be converted into nitrogen uh, which is obviously fine it's naturally found in oxygen which is naturally found so get rid of this is a, is a good thing because this this could lead to acid rain okay so what can society do then in reducing pollution there's loads of strategies and schemes obviously to try and reduce this so governments impose laws and taxation um, to manage pollution in their country um, now obviously we're going to uh, focus on the um, UK here um, because this is primarily for people obviously who are studying in the UK so in the UK um, obviously we have uh, car tax so we uh, your car is taxed according to the level of pollution that you produce and the more polluting um, your car is the more tax you pay this is obviously to disincentivize you from buying highly polluting vehicles um, so you pay road tax uh, most cars have to go through a mandatory MOT test as well. Um, so if you've got a brand new car, you don't have to have an MOT um, for the first three years um, as as of today. Um, obviously, that might change in the future if you watch this in the future. Um, but um, yeah, it's um, older cars, though, have to have an MOT every year. Um, so it's just to make sure they test for emissions and to make sure the car is not polluting more than it should be. And all new cars now have to be fitted with a catalytic converter. Um, and they've got to meet strict emissions standards. Um, if they fail them, the car cannot be sold in the UK. So all cars by law must have a catalytic converter attached to them now. Some older vehicles, really older vehicles, may not have a catalytic converter. 
um, but um, the ones that go on the roads do. Um, another thing actually is encouraging people to share the car, um, or take public transport or cycle to work. Obviously, this is reducing the levels of vehicles on the road. Um, taking a bus instead, which can carry 60 odd people, is better than having 60 different cars on the road. And most governments are bound to international agreements as well. Um, so um, that's basically to reduce the amount of emissions such as carbon dioxide. So there's a global and um, uh, a global agreement by um, some of the most powerful countries in the world to reduce carbon emissions uh, and to try and manage their pollution levels. <coughs> okay, so future fuels. So let's have a look at some alternatives. So fuels of the future, they must be economically viable and low on emissions for them to be sustainable. So solar, wind and wave energy is nearly carbon neutral, okay? And it is renewable, which is good. We won't run out of it. So um, there may be some carbon dioxide emitted through the manufacturing of these things, like the wind turbines and the panels. Um, but that's why it's nearly carbon neutral, but it, it's pretty it's pretty green. Obviously, if the, the factory... Um, if the factory that makes them is using green energy as well to power it, then obviously that's going to be a lot better. The problem is they're not very reliable. Um, there's no energy is produced when there's no wind. Um, wind turbines won't spin. If there's um, dark or at night, obviously you can't produce any electricity at night uh, with solar panels because there's no sun. So they are a little bit temperamental. And as a result, we need loads of them. Okay, You have to produce a lot of wind turbines and a lot of solar panels to make the same amount of energy that we do from coal-fired power stations. So at the minute, the efficiency of these um, uh, power generation is, isn't is really as high as what we're getting with coal um, or other other forms of uh, energy, such as nuclear, for example. So, but, you know, as technology improves, eventually, who knows, we'll, we'll, we'll probably get there. Okay, so future fuels, biofuels. So biofuels such as ethanol is made from biological matter that's died. Uh, ethanol has been used as a fuel in countries uh, where we've got a good supply of sugar cane. So Brazil is one of them in particular where it's nice and warm. Uh, you can grow this sugar cane quite well. One of the bigger uses of biofuels, in this case bioethanol in particular, and this is actually mixed with the petrol. Uh, sugar is fermented. Uh, and we produce this alcohol here, so it's harvested. Obviously, this is just a picture showing sugar cane being harvested. Some of the advantages of doing this is that biofuels are renewable, so they're much more sustainable than crude oil. Obviously, we can keep growing the um, the sugar cane. And biofuels, they produce carbon dioxide when they're burnt. However, they're classed as carbon neutral because the carbon dioxide is absorbed in photosynthesis when that sugar cane is growing. The disadvantages, though, is it's expensive to convert existing um, engines, your petrol engines, to take fuel with higher levels of ethanol uh, inside it. So that's going to be quite a cost, uh, costly thing and people replacing cars. And also, we have to use land to grow this crop um, to make the fuel. Obviously, uh, in, a, in a country where you may have um, food shortages, um, you can understand why it might be a bit of a concern if you're using a lot of land for growing a fuel and not food um, to feed its citizens. So um, it can be a bit of a concern, so it has to be managed properly. Hydrogen, uh, hydrogen can be burnt in a fuel cell um, or used in a fuel cell, sorry. So it can either be burnt um, or you can have hydrogen fuel cells as well to make the electricity. Um, and actually the only product we produce is water, um, which is better than, than most uh, em emitting products from things like fossil fuels. So hydrogen is actually made from extracting um, uh, seawater. So this is ideal if you, if you live in an island or if you're close to close to the sea. Um, and basically this takes energy to do though. Um, so energy really is seen as an energy, um, hydrogen sorry, is seen as an energy carrier because you need to, um, obviously you need a pump to pull the water from the sea and then you need to um, extract it um, using electrolysis to get your hydrogen. So, like I say, the method of extraction is important. If the fuel is used to extract hydrogen is renewable, then it's more sustainable than using fossil fuels. So it depends if how which fuel we're using to actually extract the hydrogen from the seawater. That is really, really important. Um, hydrogen, the problem is, though, it's really difficult to store. It's a very light gas, incredibly light gas, actually. Really difficult to transport as well. It's a flammable liquid. 
has to be pressurized in a liquid really um it's a flammable gas sorry has to be pressurized as a liquid um to make sure that it's um economic economical to transport otherwise you're literally just transporting thin air literally um so you have to pressurize it put it into a liquid so you get more hydrogen in a tank um and it's more economical to do um but hydrogen also has a low energy to volume ratio um, which means you're going to burn through a lot of hydrogen basically to power a car. You're going to have to fill up quite a few times. Uh, the infrastructure needs updating too. Um, hydrogen can't just go through normal pipes that we have under the ground. You have to have a new pipe work. We have to have engines that have been modified to take hydrogen fuel. Uh, we need new filling stations, hydrogen fuel stations. Uh, it's really expensive. So uh, it really needs a large amount of investment and in infrastructure to get this thing uh, off the ground. Okay, so governments need an energy strategy, um, and in particular, the UK must ensure that its energy mix is sustainable for today and for the future as well. Now, it faces challenges including rising energy costs, uh, global demand is increasing, obviously, for fossil fuels. Um, we also have um, things such as political issues and terrorism. Um, this can obviously disrupt um, oil supplies from countries which may have, which may be. Um, in a little bit of a, um, a, like a civil war or you may have uh, political groups blocking or stopping the supply of fossil fuels to certain countries because of political tensions all sorts of things little things like that can really push up the price of your fossil fuel now to protect the uk's energy security the government must use an efficient use of fossil fuels okay so we've got to store some and try and use them as efficiently as we can um so the government's role really is to educate its citizens about being more efficient with energy. So you might see um, TV adverts, you'll see incentives to car share, you've got bus lanes trying to encourage people to use the bus, cycle lanes are popping up, they're becoming more, more and more common to try and get people away from using uh, fossil fuel based cars. Electric cars are now starting to come onto the road, so governments are incentivizing the use of electric cars because it's um, there's a less of a demand on fossil fuels directly again it depends on how the electricity is being generated but again it's it's a move away from fossil fuels and like i say the incentivize the reduction of carbon dioxide by taxation subsidizing green technology like i said uh, and using more renewable resources as well so granting permission for wind turbines and incentivizing solar panels on people's houses etc uh, in other countries though and um, their energy systems could be a lot different so for example in brazil uh, where we're seeing the use of sugarcane to produce ethanol and um, obviously the use of land to grow crops for fuels and um, this is their main fuel source um, for cars as well so you've got to think about how the land is used is it used effectively etc etc and that's it that's an overview of alkenes fuels of polymers it's quite a nice topic actually and um, it's very applied it's quite nice um please show your support for this channel and um, all these videos are completely free um, all I all I ask in return is that you just subscribe to the channel uh, and you get all the updates. So just click on the uh, circle in the middle of the screen as you can see there. And just a reminder that you can actually purchase these slides as well. They're great value for money. They help you to get that A in chemistry or A star if you're really pushing for it. Um, if you click on the link in the description box and you can get a hold of them there. You actually buy the whole series uh, for Salters as well at a reduced price. But um, that's it. Bye bye.